Good morning. Good morning. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday also means it's the end of the season of Epiphany and preparation for a season of land. So we have land bags in the back for everyone to take home. In the United States, this is the last Sunday of African American History Month. Our church integrates related message in our worship, newsletter, social media platform, in all our activities, including our newest Quick Courage episodes. By doing so, we want to demonstrate the essence of systematic discrimination against our African American siblings in the past and how we can work together and provide a vision for an equality that we want to provide, we want to live in, in the future. In Taiwan and around the world, today is also the day some Taiwanese Christians will host a memorial service for those who were murdered on February 28, 1947, the so-called 228 massacre. And the 43 years white terrorist period under the martial law, which has ended in 1987 and 1992, some of the victims' family were forced to leave for another country for survival. Till today, lots of Taiwan is still working on the restorative justice and documentary about the history. The scripture today, scholars agree that it belongs to the priestly tradition. At the beginning of Exodus chapter 34, God continued to talk to Moses, the mediator, in the cloud and on the mountain. God also asked Moses to make two other tablets and have the same word written down on the tablets. Also in this chapter, Moses witnessed the presence and the glory of God. Moses also witnessed some of the most important characteristics of God. It's written in chapter 34, verse 6 to 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping faithful love for the thousandth generation, Forgiving, forgiving inequality and transgression and sin, yet by no means curing the guilty by visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Moses offered prayer for those stiff-necked Israelites and requested request the, the pardon and taken as God's inheritance. Guide and Moses continued their conversations and the renewal covenant. Moses stayed with God for 40 days and 40 nights. The scripture today is right after those 40 days. Moses returned to the community with the renewed tablets, including the Ten Commandments and the more amend, amended living and worshiping protocols. We might be curious about the rule Moses plays here. He's a covenant mediator or emissary. The covenant is made with him, through him, with the Israelites. The renewed covenant is revised after the failure of the first covenant because of Israelite worshiping of the golden calf and their, their death of 3,000 Israelites. They were, killed by, they were killed by the Levites led by Moses himself. People were warned by Moses regarding the danger of adopting customs from non-Israelites and the worshiping of other gods. The sermon title today is Face to Face with God. God with the Azarist 
is a term introduced by a feminist theologian, Schuschler Fiorenza. Fiorenza remind, reminds us that the construction of God is always in favor of a particular group. In theological development, in church practice, even in the text and written in the book, by investigations deeper and raising suspicions, we may, un, we may uncover those inter institutionalized protocols and instruments, liberate God from kidnapping by a certain group, and provide an alternative interpretation understanding for new ground for our future. I believe it's a good try today for Transfiguration Sunday. Let's think about one thing. What made Moses' face and skin shine? The scripture today implies that Moses himself had no idea what happened to him. But Aaron and the rest of the Israelites, they were afraid to come near him. It was until Moses encouraged him and tried to have a conversation with them, encouraged them to come forward, then those people, they feel comfortable to come forward. And the Israelites received the renewal covenant with God through Moses, the emissary. The scriptures imply the light on Moses' face and skin is not from Moses himself, but from God's radiance that was imported to Moses. It is to say, God is the one who delivered the shining light, and Moses' face reflected on that light. Moses' face and skin were shown by God's presence and glory. It was the most sacred moment a human created by God reflected on the Creator's glory. It was also the sacred moment that God chose a human to be the mediator and emissary between the Almighty and the mortals. Moses is the chosen one and the Israelites is a chosen people. In this context, a solid leadership of Moses and a clear boundary of right, just, worship of daily life are defined. The boundaries also create a it differentiated us and the others. What can and cannot be due to others and us? There are differences here. For example, for our people, you should not kill. But to the others, I, Adonai, Adonai, will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites, and make no covenant with them for what prostitute themselves to their gods. Turn no wives from them, for their god and daughters will make your sons prostitute themselves to their god. But Israelites, they are allowed and commanded to occupy their land. God promised Israelites that God will cast all nations before you and enlarge your border. No one should convert your land when you go up to appear before the Lord, your God, three times in a year. It seems to me that this God, who spoke to Moses and made a renewed covenant with the Israelites, only showed mercy, grace, steadfast love for a particular group of people. Moses, as an emissary, could kill his own 3,000 people in the name of God. Aaron, who built a golden calf, and other leaders who actually sent out this request of making a golden calf in a community, they were pardoned. But their followers, the ordinary people, they were killed. The scripture today says, Aaron and Israelites were afraid when they saw Moses' face shine. If I were one of them, I would have run away already from that guy. 
I wonder that guy, the agent of death, had upgraded and come back for me. In this sense, we can also realize that the ideology of a community, the Israelites, a portal nationalism, the border and the regulations, a pure ethnicity and the people that God had chosen and Almighty divine that all nations should pay respect to and show their fear to the God of Israelites. And a determined leader who was chosen by the Almighty Power who could kill 3,000 their siblings with assistance. When Moses and the Levites did it, they did it without a tear or tremble. I'm afraid. What this God praise and the glory that Moses witnessed in those 40 days and nights and finally reflect on his face and skin is problematic to our current context. We should encounter this God and this glory face to face. However, those Israelites and all Jews, they were not always privileged from time to time in human history. The humanizations that Exodus implied in the Bible toward those non-Israelites also have been imported toward the Jews. For example, the key word in the scripture today, in chapter 34, verse 29, Karam was understood as ray, radiate, shine in most of the translation. However, in Psalms chapter 69, verse 13, the same verb was understood to have horn, a horn on your head. For some reason, when Jerome of Strindon translated his version of Latin Bible, Vulgate, in the fourth century, Moses was honed in the presence of God in his translation. And this is not the only incident. The image of Moses with horns in the, in the mediative and Renaissance art, including Michelangelo's painting and statues, Moses was honed in his head. And this notion also connects with Satan's horns afterwards. It turned out that the anti semitic believe Jews had horns on their head. For a long time, Jews were treated much better among non-Christian territories. In the Second Corinthians chapter 3, the editor argues that Moses' veil, who tried to protect Moses and the Israelites, are still in, it still covers Israelites' heart. So those Jews, they could not really understand God unless they through Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God. Moses' sacred moment become one of the barriers that Jews could not really understand, could not really know God. In some Christian circle today, Jews were still projected as murderer of their savior. They deserve to be the lost people from the redemption. This extremely extreme denial leads to the most dangerous ignorance of the tragic suffering in human history. In the United States, one third of Americans do not believe six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Near two thirds of the younger Americans are unaware of Holocaust at all. Dehumanization makes coolness and ignorance easier than we can than we could imagine. We should also ask, especially during the African American History Month, what are the experiences of being an African American symbol in our country, in our community? What the image received by and delivered to the public and the history? How does a combination of nationalism, racism, economic privilege, and the chosen leadership 
and Christianity has undermined the humanity and African Americans' dignity. We should also ask, especially on the eve of the 75th anniversary of the 228 massacre, why Taiwanese was treated as the Amorites, Canaanites, Hevites, Parasites, Hevites, and Jebusites by the Chinese Nationalist Party government? Why were the Taiwans were killed due to the excuse of the culture misunderstanding? What could a Methodist Christian dictator gain so much support from the United States government, politicians, and religious leaders, which allowed him, this Methodist dictator, to execute ordinary people for his own good? Before we go there, there's one thing when we should think about, we should talk about. With Gambert Michelson, the, the former General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America, RCA, an active member in the ecumenical circles, addressed his thoughts on Russian invasions of Ukraine. The following are quote from his thought. As Ukrainians, soldiers and Russian soldiers are engaging on one another in mortal combat. In many cases, Orthodox Christians are killing Orthodox Christians. John Paul II said, War is always a defeat for humanity, but this war is a defeat for Christianity. As baptized believers kill one another, that split, that split mirrors the political conflict which has now erupted into war. Now it's important because how Putin envisions Russia's identity and global role. He has committed to see the glories and the geography of Mother Russia restored. It. Re religiously, he sees as perceiving Christian civilizations against the secular dependence of the West. And for that, his transitional alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church is essential. Like the Tsar, he wants to see Moscow as the center of a political and a military power over an empire that is that is sanctified by the blessing of the Russian Orthodox Church. And he wants the Orthodox Church he can control to reign in Ukraine. To be honest, the version of Christianity companioned by those colleagues from the Russian Orthodox Church often bears a strong resemblance to the white, masculine, militarized vision of evangelical faith described with such insightful analysis by Christian Dumas in her best-selling book, Jesus and John Wayne. So it makes sense that Steve Bannon and the voices of religious white nationalism look to Putin and other autocratic Christian leaders with such admirations. Uh, this underscores the graves and dangers of awaiting the church to the nationalistic power and preserved righteousness. The possibility of faithful prophetic witness as represented and emulated. Nationalism become idolatry, belonging to a global body of Christ which transcends national boundaries is destroyed. The possibility of the church acting within situations of conflict and wars as a channel of peacemaking vanishes. And at times, the church even ends up blazing weapons of destruction. In his quote, the World, the World Council of Churches also published a statement titled 
in Ukraine. Such a war has no excuse, neither from God nor from people. I believe in the United States, people still remember that, tra that tragic civil war in the 19th century. Slavery and economic development are part of the excuses that some believe it was right to treat the other as a natural born slave. And the Holy Bible was used to justify their desire. I'm afraid here today, there are still people having the same concept and utilizing the same means to fulfill their desire. It must be stopped now. But how? On March 4, 1865, Abraham Lincoln gave an address saying, both sides read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invoked his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wrinkling their bread from the sweat of other men's face. But let us judge not, and we be not judged. The prayer of both could not be answered that of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has its own purpose. <laughs> there was a demonstration of resistance against kidnapping God for our own preference and letting God be God. This could be the first step for us too. In the common missionary today, Gospel of Luke chapter 9, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking to each other. Jesus' face was changed and shone. Disciples saw his glory would like to make three dwellings for three of them. The glory among Jesus, Moses, and Elijah is from the conversation regarding what Jesus will accomplish in Jerusalem. The glory is to turn the temple upside down, bring the good news to the poor, heal and take good care of the wounded, save free those who were captured, and eventually sacrifice on the cross in the end. The leader of the Christian movement is to die to the privilege, die to the empire, die to the boundary and segregation, and stand up for those who could not fight for themselves. If we learn from Jesus the Christ, who was driven by the unconditional love. From this point, Jesus died to God, constructed by Pharisees, Jewish elites, and the Roman Empire. Jesus was, has, face to face with God, and he's not alone. In the book of Job, Job also faced a God, constructed by his friend. Job was suffering from the loss of his family and properties without a reasonable explanation. His friends become the prosecutors, prosecutors change all his doing and try to prove he's wrong and Job deserve it. Job keep asking for a reasonable explanation and defend himself. Finally, God showed up and discoursed God, him, her, themselves in front of Job and his friend. And eventually, in the book of Job, Job faced a God and saying, Here I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. In the book of Acts, Stephen stood in front of the council Sanhedrin, assembled by the elders, Pharisees, and other leaders, addressed the story of Exodus, the story of liberation from slavery, and how the image of God that those stiff-necked council members have wrongly constructed and implemented among Israelites. Stephen saw the glory of God filled with spirit and then was stoned to death in this story. 
I believe deeply that not only Jesus' face shone, but also Job's and Stephen's. They disclosed the fake God and let the true God revealed. Their figures' image were transformed. Their lives let us know what God and the kingdom of God should be. They are the image of a chosen leader. This reminds me of the civil rights movement in the United States, led by Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1960s. Dr. King encouraged that Dr. King encountered that God face to face, constructed by this country. Just like the followers, many followers of Jesus. Before I conclude the message today, I would like to contextualize Dr. King's speech in 1963 to reflect on our situation today. How far away is the day that we allow freedom ring? When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black people and white people and all people of color, Jews and Gentile, Protestant and Catholic, Eucarians and Russians, Eucarian Orthodox Church and Russian Orthodox Church, Native, Amer Native Taiwanese and Taiwanese who came afterwards, Chinese and Taiwanese, Native Americans and American to be, will be able to join hands, sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, which also resonates with our hearts in different cultures and in different languages. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. We are free at last. We are envisioning a critical transformation. This is the day that the glory of God shines upon us and transforms us. I hope that today, or that day, is much nearer than we expected, starting from us, starting from here and now. Amen.